All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second October middle school virtual session. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some digital classroom management tools that you can use with your students. We're going to talk about classroom management kind of in two different definitions today. We're going to talk about the very traditional uh, classroom management definition of like controlling student behaviors and even ways to give students some agency over their own behaviors, let them uh, monitor and self control. But then we're also going to talk about classroom management in terms of things like monitoring engagement, seeing are your students working on what you're asking them to work on? Are they fully engaged? Are they partially engaged? Not just do they get it, but are they even trying to get it as we go into the lesson today? <clears throat> So the agenda, I'm going to show you guys uh, two different digital tools that you can use for, again, that more traditional definition of classroom management. The first one is Classroom Screen. This one has all kinds of really neat applications all built into one tool that teachers can use for free. Like a lot of services, it is what we call a freemium, meaning that you get A, B, and C for free. You can also pay for an upgraded account and get X, Y, and Z, but I'm going to focus entirely on what you can get with the free account today. And then we're going to talk about a site called Bouncy Balls, which gives your students that ability to monitor their own behavior um, and maybe have a little bit of fun, which, you know, kids like to do. Um, and then we're going to get into that idea of monitoring student engagement and participation and the applications that we have in the digital world that can help you with that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump out of the presentation and I'm going to get started in the first application that I wanted to showcase today. And that is classroomscreen.com. So the web address is simply classroomscreen.com. As I said a moment ago, it is a freemium, so anybody, uh, any teacher, any staff member in AACPS can go ahead and create an account for free. There's only one aspect of this that students would even need to use, and it is approved for students as well. So I'll show that one when we get there. But I'm going to go ahead and launch my classroom screen. And you'll see right away it puts some sort of a graphic or an image into the background that fills the screen for you. Across the bottom, you have this entire toolbar here that even has just an option here in the end to uh, expand it and show even more widgets, as they call them. So all kinds of tools that you can use for classroom management with your students. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work my way across from left to right with the different tools here and just give you an idea of what you can do with these. So starting with our very first tool over here on the left hand side, and that's our background. You can see we've got this lovely majestic lion. Every time you create a new screen, it's going to automatically create a background for you, but you can click here to choose any background that you would like. So you'll see that we have some uh, themed or seasonal seasonally appropriate backgrounds up here, but then we also get into things like nature, landmarks, calm and neutral. Animated backgrounds means there will be some kind of movement into the background. So you can see here we've got this uh, bird on a rock, but the water behind the bird is moving because we chose one of the animated backgrounds. And then you just have plain basic colors here or gradients if you don't want anything too distracting for your students. And then you even have the option to upload your own pictures. So if you teach something uh, very specific, you know, I myself am teaching science with students, we're learning about space. So we've got this lovely one here with a moon. We've got this other one here with like the Aurora Borealis or, or some sort of uh, natural lights in the sky. But if I wanted to try something else space themed, I could certainly upload my own pictures in order to do that. So simply select on the background that you want. It applies it and closes the selection window for you. The next one is the option to do a poll. And this is the aspect I mentioned a moment ago that would have um, students engaging in it if you choose to do it that way. So when you poll your students, you can have a multiple choice. You can have smileys where they're simply choosing whether they're happy, neutral, or sad about something, and then true, false. If we start with something very traditional like multiple choice, you'll see over on the right-hand side, it's going to open this partial window for me to type in the question that I'm asking my students, as well as the different answer choices that I want them to utilize.
As with most multiple choice in this type of thing, you can remove answer choices if you only want to have two or three. You can add answer choices if you want to have more than four. So I'm kind of doing a touch base with my students here. How do you feel about today's topic? The students have either got it, they're lost, or they're somewhere in between. So I only need three options there. Then you have a couple of other options down here for the bottom. You can close the voting. So if you don't want students to continue to answer, you tell them we've got two minutes when two minutes is up. You close the voting so that you can begin to go over the results without them continuing to come in. You can hide the results from students. You can um, allow remote voting, buttons on the screen, or both. And this is where we talk about um, whether or not you want to allow the students to log into Classroom Screen to complete your poll. Right now, it's selected for buttons on the screen, which means I would be projecting this up on my smart board and students would walk up and they would physically press B if they wanted to choose B, C if they wanted to tell me that they're totally lost. <coughs> One of the problems with a question like this and students physically walking up to the board is that they might feel embarrassed admitting in front of the whole class that they are lost. So this might be an option where I would prefer the choice for remote voting and allow the students to access this from their Chromebooks and then they would be anonymous when they selected A, B, or C. You'll notice as soon as I selected on remote voting, it popped up instructions across the top of my screen. My students are now told to go to joincrs.com and use the code 7082079. You would, of course, get your own code. I even have the option to put this up on the screen as a QR code if I feel that might be an easier way for my students to get in. Or if I were going to use this as a part of my lesson, I might choose to put this up as like a Brightspace web link or something that they can click on from, say, the announcements page or um, Again, something that I would put into content as like a web link, a way that they can actually get to that web address, join crs.com and put in my code in order to answer the question. But that would certainly allow them to do this anonymously if they chose to. So you have the options between remote voting that they can do on their own device, buttons on the screen, which would involve them coming up to the screen to select on something, or using a combination of those. So if you have um, any difficulties in your class getting your students to bring their Chromebooks, maybe half your class has their Chromebook today. You could have both remote and buttons on the screen. So you would be able to say to the kids, hey, if you don't have your Chromebook, you don't have a device handy right now, come on up and select your choice on the screen. Everybody else, go ahead and select it from your device. <clears throat> Finally, down here at the bottom, we have the options to choose how the results are presented to um, you and your students. Right now, and by default, it goes to a bar graph. So you can see we've got one person who's selected B, one person who's selected C, but we could change that to a pie chart. We could change it to a donut, kind of like a pie, but not filled in there in the middle. So <clears throat> options for how you uh, actually present the results to yourself and your students. And then you can simply choose the color of the, the question as it's presented to the students, the, the color of the results right there. And again, the default is always going to kind of be that white background with some bright splashy colors there in the middle. I'm going to go ahead and slide this over and show you guys that as I select on different things, I can add multiple things to the screen at one time. So we changed the background. We looked at the poll option there. Moving across, we now have a random name chooser here. So the ability to load in something like a class list or even a list of vocabulary words and have it randomly select them there. So now you'll notice that we've got two different tiles or widgets on the screen at the same time. So you can actually load this application up with multiple tiles or widgets that you plan to use as a part of your lesson today. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a class list here to use with this widget. <coughs> and that's going to be done by selecting my gear up here in the upper right hand corner. And you'll see that it's got some of those same options that we saw a moment ago, like the color theme down there at the bottom is going to be pretty standard across um, the different widgets that you'll see right here. You can always apply a color choice to how that card, that tile, that widget presents on the screen there. 
So when I go to choose list, you'll see that I've created one class list previously, and I'll show you guys how to do that in just a moment. But you could just copy and paste your class list in right here. So I could say, you know, Tracy's in my class. I could say Elizabeth is in my class. So I could just type it in right here. But if I'm using the same list of students again and again, let's be honest, you do. You have the same roster of students over and over again. You have the ability to create your lists or your groups of classes here. So you can see I've got one called first period where I've just loaded in all the people in my office, but I could select on create new name list. We'll call this one uh, second period. <laughs> And then once again, copy and paste in my students' names from someplace if I have a list handy. If I don't, I can type them all out right there. I'm going to go ahead and click cancel because again, you'll see that I have a list that's already been created here for my first period class. I can edit this at some point in the future if I need to, uh, which would allow me to add new students to it, delete students if my roster is still changing at the beginning of the year. So now if I select on my first period class there, then all I have to do when I want to randomly select a name is click that little button at the bottom right there and it'll flip through all the students in my class. It's a very small class, only eight, and it will choose one of those students there. <coughs> I've got a couple of options here. One of them is to enable or disable sounds. <coughs> Excuse me. And the sound is actually pretty subtle. I don't know if you guys can hear that. It's just sort of this subtle ticking noise as it clicks through those. But if for whatever reason that's annoying for you or unwanted, you could simply turn that off. And then when you go to select, there's no sound with it at all. Enabling or disabling the animations, you'll see how it's kind of pretending to shuffle through them. If I turn off the animations, it simply selects the next student without all the fanfare going on right there. And then remember chosen students ensures that it doesn't keep picking the same, same student over and over again. So kind of the same way you might have used equity sticks in your classroom, where if you pull out the stick that has Tracy's name on it, you set it aside and you don't use that one again today because you don't want to keep calling on Tracy over and over again. If we go through everybody in the class, it will reset. Yep. And then you'll see that it goes back to choosing the same students again. So again, a pretty small class because I'm just using the eight people in my office. But once it's selected everybody in the class, it will go back to using those again. So great option here to set up your class lists. Or again, you could even use this to choose vocabulary words. What, what do you want the students to define today? Are you doing some sort of a... Um, a review before a quiz. You could have them review um, terms that you've been working on and they're randomly selected for the students to choose between. All right, once again, I'm going to slide this tile out of the way and then I'm going to select on the next option here, which is just to generate your own QR code. And you'll see that it pops out another one of these little tiles or cards on the screen. You can simply paste in the URL. So let me go back and find something. I'll just go ahead and copy my web address for class link. Paste that one in, generate the QR code, and now I just have something ready on my screen that the students can scan from their Chromebooks or if I'm letting them use other devices in my classroom, such as their phones, I've got a QR code ready for them to scan to get into an activity that I want them into quickly. We'll slide that one over. If your screen starts to get crowded, maybe I don't need my poll anymore. I can select on that and I can click the X in the corner to remove that card at some point. I'm also a fan of hiding things off the side of the screen. So if I'm not ready for the QR code yet, I don't want kids scanning that and jumping into the next activity when I'm still talking about the warm up. I can have it there. It's ready to go, but I kind of hide it off the side of the screen until I'm ready and I say, all right, guys, we're going to transition to the next activity. Let's go ahead and scan the QR code and you guys are ready to jump into the next thing. So I like kind of pushing things off the side of the screen when I don't need them right now. Another great tool. Oh. It already maxed out. This is a noise level meter. So if I have the students doing some sort of independent or group work, we know that sometimes they get a little bit um, unaware of their own noise level in the class. You can simply have a noise meter up on the screen. And as the students are discussing their activities, it's measuring their noise level. You can set uh, the 
level that you would like it to. So now I'm making it much less sensitive. And you can see that as I'm talking, it's continuing to stay in that blue area and not going into the red quite as much as it did when the tolerance or sensitivity was turned way down here. There is a chime noise. And again, I don't know if you guys are hearing that. I'm definitely hearing it in my ears. When it goes into the red, it's doing this bell pinging. If I don't want the bell, if that's distracting to my students or to me, I can turn that off. And now it's just a visual noise monitor. They can still look up at the screen at any time to see if they're in the red or the blue, but um, it's not making that pinging noise anymore. <clears throat> and then of course I can turn off the microphone, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a noise meter for a, an activity specific like this one, because the only input for sound is coming from my microphone. But if you, your teacher, were talking into your light speed system or something like that, and you wanted this to only be paying attention to the noise coming from the classroom, you would definitely want to turn off your microphone or it would be doing to you what it's doing to me, which is going into the red simply because you're speaking and giving your students instructions instruction into the microphone built into your light speed or computer system there. So we'll slide that one out of the way and we'll go on to the next option, which is to add an image there. So this is a place where you could put together some sort of a slide deck or um, images that you wanted your students to use. I personally do a lot of warm-ups um, where it's like, I see, I think, I wonder, and I give my students pictures from like the James Webb telescope um, that have been captured recently. And I ask them to look at it and, and think about it. What do you see? What do you wonder about? And this would be a great way to do that without having to load it into my Brightspace course where the kids have to go eight clicks in before they can actually see the picture and think about it. I could just have have it up here on the screen. So when we click on open settings, you'll see you have the ability to upload your picture here. So I'm going to go ahead and select on something that we can put into this and use as an example here. So let me get into my downloads here and see what pictures I might have captured and put in here recently that I've used with my students. Wouldn't it be nice if I could always find something super quickly, but no, sometimes you got to dig around a little bit. So Let's go find something that I have shown to my class recently here. All right. <clears throat> so this is Jupiter's moon Io. I'm going to turn off that noise meter because now it's just annoying me. This is uh, Io, one of Jupiter's moons right here. So again, this would be a great way to have a warm up where this picture is just sitting on the screen. And as my students come into the class, they already know we do an I see, I think, I wonder activity to start off as their warm up every day. They could just be looking at it. They could turn and discuss with their neighbor. They could make some notes on paper um, about what they see and what they think about this picture here. Once again, I can push it off the side of the screen. If I want to use it later in the class, I can remove it by clicking on the X or I can have it sharing space with the other tiles. One of the number one uses for ClassroomScreen.com is honestly just this text box. The first um, couple of weeks of the school year when I was teaching my, my class with students, I found myself repeating the same series of steps over and over and over again. As the kids would come in and get logged onto their Chromebooks, I would be like, okay, guys, from ClassLink, you're going to click on Brightspace. Then you're going to click on your waffle icon. Then you're going to look for Mission to the Stars. Then you're going to click on Content. Then you're going to go to the week of, and then you're going to go to the warm up, which I was repeating those same series of steps over and over again. So the number one thing I started doing with classroom, um, classroomscreen.com was just typing in those series of steps. First place you're going to click from class link is Brightspace. Then you're going to go to your waffle icon. Then you're going to go to mission to the stars because that's the class I'm teaching. Then you're going to click on content from in there. And then we're going to go to week of, and then you're going to go to, and I always start my warmups off with a date. So it would be like 1025 warmup. But what I also like to do, and again, I've said this a couple of times, I like to hide these off the side of the screen. So I might have a second text box on here that gives my students the next series of steps. So maybe next after we do that, we're going to click from class link into Lumio by Smart. And then you're going to choose, um, let it, let's see what it is, enter class ID. 
And my ID is, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, something like that. So I might have my second series of steps also up there, but hiding off of the screen. So when they come in, the first thing we're going to do is the warm up. So you guys are going to go through this series of steps. I don't have the kids asking me, can you repeat that again? Can you repeat that again? Can you repeat that? It's written on the board up there for everybody to see that this is what we're going to do first when you come into class today. So then when we finish that, I can either delete this by clicking the red X or I can grab the handle down here, push this one off the side of the screen and grab the next series of steps and slide that one out. So I've preloaded my screen with all the different series of steps that I'm going to give them to get into their warm up, to get into their classroom activities, to get into their exit ticket, whatever we're going to do today. All the steps are there and they're just hiding until I'm ready to pull them out and show them to the students. And you can, of course, see when it comes to the text box here, you've got a very traditional toolbar here. You can change the size of the font. Um, if you're projecting this up on the smart board, of course, you're going to need a nice, big, bold font. You can change the style. You can do things like highlight, underline, bold, center all the standard text things that you would expect to be able to do to help your students see the series of steps that you're putting up there for them. Our next one is a drawing tool. And forgive me, this one is not going to work great because I'm on a desktop with a traditional mouse right now. But if you are using your laptop, you could have a stylus, you could use your finger, and you could actually be drawing here on the screen for your students to see. So you'll see we've got a paintbrush tool here, which gives us different color choices. And then when we go to draw, we get sort of a thick line stroke. The next one over is a pen tool. If you select it, you get the same options. You can choose the color. And then when you go to draw, you get a much thinner, um, more rigid line. You know, it's see how it kind of made that sharper angle there. So again, if you were using a stylus or um, a touch screen of some kind, you could easily be handwriting um, equations, annotations, things like that for your students. You've got an eraser tool here, which if you simply click and drag across anything that you place on the page will erase those. You've got a circle making tool here, which allows you to make ovals, circles, you can drag into any direction. You've got the option to make lines, lines with arrows, and then squares and rectangles as well. Each of these, if you select on them a second time, you get that same color selection tool that we saw with the paintbrush and the pen there, where you can choose between all of the different standard colors there. You can even do things like dotted lines for your shapes your arrows, your lines, and so on. If you want to be able to manipulate the objects that you place into the drawing screen here, you can select on the hand, which would allow you to move them. So again, I can sort of push this stuff off the side of the screen if I want to keep drawing and adding more to it. And then you've got your very traditional undo and redo options here, which allow you to erase, remove, add um, objects back in as you're working on those. So just a drawing tool tool here to make it easier for you to do things um, rather than always typing or adding images there. One of the cool settings in the drawing tool, so I'm going to click on my gear here in the upper right hand corner, is the ability to choose the background or the paper that is behind it. You can have lined paper for your students if you're working on letters. <coughs> you can have graph paper here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we've got some other things. Here's a, sort of a triangular grid, um, very traditional lined paper for our younger students, um, music paper here, something with like a honeycomb pattern, and then a clock face, which again is also pretty cool for our younger learners here. If teachers are working on telling time with students, they can easily uh, bring that up. And then let's get rid of some of these things. They could use uh, something like the arrow tool there to draw different clock faces and then ask the students, you know, what time is it if, uh, if, if this is what you see on the screen. So um, some cool backgrounds there. The color theme is always an option um, in the settings for each of these tools as well. When you're done using the drawing tool, click the X to remove that widget from the page. And then the next tool that we have here is what's called work symbols. 
So depending on what you're asking the students to do, you can put up something to notify them that this should be silent work, this should be uh, you working quietly with a single partner, you having a discussion with a neighbor if you have difficulty, and now we're doing work together. And that's where these types of things come together really nicely, that I can have that and the noise level meter out at the same time. So, okay, guys, you should be working together. It's okay for you to be discussing things, but I want you to be mindful of the noise level. So I'm going to put this up. I'm going to turn on that bell so that you guys can be aware of how much noise you're making. The next one after those work symbols is also a great partner to the work symbols, and that's your traditional stoplight um, option there. So if I tell the class, all right, guys, we've got 10 minutes to be working on this, I can tell them it's now green light time, you should be working on it. When I give them that last minute countdown, hey, guys, one more minute for you to be working with your neighbors on this. So I now go to yellow light. And when I want them to stop the activity, I go to red light, I call everybody's attention back to me. And we're ready to transition to uh, the next activity that we're going to do. This is another one where the settings gear gives you some neat options here. For example, you can change the style of your traffic light, but you can also enable descriptions. So if you want to tell the students specifically what your red light, yellow light, and green light means, you can actually type those out. So I can tell them stop working is what red light means. Yellow light for me means one minute warning and green light means last discussion. Whoops, can't spell discussion still. Seem to want to start that with a C. So now those descriptions are actually displayed on the screen right next to the stoplight. So as I go between the different colors here, they know it's green. I should be discussing this with my neighbor or my table mates. It's a one minute warning and now I'm supposed to stop working. So some of these tools work really well together when you um, put multiple on the screen. You'll also notice that there is no true background or foreground with these. If I select on a widget, it pops to the front in front of another widget. So again, you can have multiple things on the screen. And if you want to pull out the directions for what the students are supposed to do next, you can just put it right on top of the other widgets until you're done with it. Click the X, it's gone, and now we go right back to, okay, guys, now it's silent independent work time. I'm going to be monitoring your noise level, and it's time to go ahead and get started with, and I'd probably have to change that description because I just said it's silent time, but I could change green to independent work or something like that. Another tool that works really great with these and that I use a lot with this application is the timer. If I tell the, the class, all right, guys, you've got five minutes to complete your warm up, I can just go ahead and set the timer for that, click play, and the students can look up at the screen at any time to see how much time they have left in the activity. If I decide that they're doing a great job, they're working on it, they're really engaged with it, but five minutes isn't nearly enough, I don't even have to stop it and reset it. I can simply click the up or down buttons to give them more or less time in the ongoing timer there. If I pause, give the students instructions, I can of course start that timer right where it was, but if I click stop, it does reset at the original time that was set there. So if you want to simply um, repeat your instructions or uh, clarify something for the students, you will want to use the pause button and not the stop. Let's go into the gear. We've got a couple of neat options here. Like um, at some point in the timer, I'll go all the way down to like a one minute timer so that you guys can see this. That circle that's uh, the visual countdown will turn red. You get to determine where that turns red. For example, when it's reached its last 25%, it will turn red according to the default settings. So um, you can change that if you want it to go red uh, with more or less time available for them. <coughs> the default time for this widget <coughs> is 10 minutes. 
If you typically use 15 minutes for all of your class activities, you can, of course, change that as well. The color theme, again, that's standard across most of the different widgets in this. And then what sound do you want it to make when time is up to alert the students? By default, it's that ding dong. You can see now it's gone red, but you can have it so that there's no sound or something like a cowbell, an alarm clock, whatever you like um, to have in there, uh, you can change that one too as well. And there's our ding dong to let us know that we have run out of time um, for this particular activity there. So I'm going to close out of this one and slide my timer over. Next, we have a clock. Uh, this, again, a great way to keep the students on track. You know, what time is, is it in class? How much time do we have left? What time are we going to be dismissed? You could just simply have a clock up in the corner um, for your students to see so that they can keep track of what time it is if they're constantly asking you how much time do we have left in class. And then, as I said in the very beginning, you do have a more widgets, which gives you some of the lesser used widgets down here as well. Things like a calendar, dice, the ability to embed a website, a group maker, which goes great with the um, random name selector up there. You've even got a stopwatch as opposed to a timer that counts down. The stopwatch would count up a webcam and a video. I'm going to go over just a couple of these down here in the more widgets area so that we can move on to the next application that I wanted to show you guys today. First is the calendar. The calendar is super cool. Um, although one of the things that I find a little bit disappointing is that I can't add anything to it. Like I can't click. So if I wanted to open the calendar and say, all right, class, let's review how our week is going to go. We could talk about the fact that today is Tuesday the 25th. Don't forget tomorrow we're reviewing for our quiz and then Thursday is going to be our quiz. But I can't click to add anything to the calendar. So it's not a functional calendar. It's more like a week at a glance or a month at a glance. I could, again, pull this up and be like, hey, guys, don't forget, next Thursday is a two-hour early dismissal day, but I can't physically put that on the calendar as a way to remind the students. The next tool that I wanted to talk about is the dice. This is a super cool tool. You don't have to open a specific application to get some dice that you can use or random number choosers that you can use for students. You can simply pull this widget out, click on it, and it spins and goes through and chooses one of the die. However, you have more great options here under settings. For example, if you need two die, you don't need to click on the widget twice and then press the roll the dice buttons twice. You can simply change it to a double or a pair of die. You can even do it with three, no more than three. Then you can change it to things like plus six or minus six. You can change those settings in there um, as well. If you go here, you can... I thought you could edit those. Maybe that's just the plus, minus, and division ones. So this one's kind of a cool way to do a quick problem with students where you could have a one die. Let's change this one to, yeah, we'll leave that one set like that. We'll duplicate it and set this one over on the other side. So now we could have this number times this number. Again, great for some of our early math learners to just randomly generate problems that they need to answer while they're working in class. All right, and then the other one that I wanted to show off from the uh, more widgets area down here is that group maker. So if you have uploaded your class in the uh, name chooser option, it does remember that down here in the group maker. So you'll see my first period class exists here too. I didn't have to load that one in twice. When I built first period in the random name choosing widget, it applied it to the random group maker as well. So if I select on first period and then choose, let's say, yeah, sure, groups of four. Um, yeah, number of groups will be four, sorry. So when I select create groups, it's going to randomly create those groups for me. And because there's only eight students in my class, every group has two students in it. But of course, you'll see I have the shuffle button and I can immediately change. Oh, no, Carrie and Stephanie can't work together. Let me shuffle those around. 
much better. So you can change the number of groups that you want, uh, depending on the activity that you're going to do. Again, you always have that color theme selection in the background, and then the ability to change the font size so that students can easily read which class they're, uh, which group they're going to be in for the activity that you're doing today. So that is a pretty quick overview of classroomscreen.com. Free application. All you have to do is create an account and you can use any of these widgets, project them on the smart board, or if you're ever teaching virtually like I am, this is a great way to present a screen to your students that helps them keep on track. They can monitor their noise level. They can uh, see how much time is left in the activity all kinds of cool tools here that I can use with my students without having to get into my LMS or into another application. The next tool that we're going to talk about is called bouncyballs.com. This is another one that is um, basically just a lot of fun, and it is designed basically for one thing and one thing only, and that is for monitoring the noise level in your classroom. When the students are engaged in an activity, you can simply put this up on the smart board and how much uh, they're bouncing around. I have to allow it to use my microphone. How much the balls are bouncing around tells your students if they're being too noisy. So right now, the only sound it's capturing is me talking into my microphone, which is why I had to turn on microphone. But you can see as I get louder, the balls bounce more and more. Just like we saw with the noise meter in uh, the classroom screen, I can change the sensitivity level if I want it to uh, bounce more or less if I want to allow the class to engage in a discussion or if they should be totally silent. I can choose how many balls, the quantity. Do I want the entire screen to be filled up with balls or fewer? That's what that total line means there is how much animation do you want on the screen. And then I can even choose what is bouncing around on the screen. By default, the website's called Bouncy Balls. So by default, by default, it gives you these little plastic balls here, but you can change it to emojis. You can change it to numbers. Now it looks like, I don't know, we're playing bingo or something. You can change it to bubbles where they float instead of falling. And just because it's Halloween time, you can change it to eyeballs too. So you can have what's bouncing around on the screen be these cute little eyeballs here. And then you can change the noise alert. What do you want the students to hear if they're being too noisy? I turned the sound off because, of course, it just kept saying shh in my ears here. You can change it to a beeping noise so that if the students are being too noisy, they get this beeping sound or you can change it to what I had just a moment ago where it just keeps saying shh if you get too noisy. Um, and then again, if you're in a situation like I am where you're talking into a microphone, if you don't want it to be capturing you, you would turn off the microphone and then it's truly only monitoring the noise level of the students there in the classroom. So two great applications designed for classroom management. The first one is classroomscreen.com. And the second one is bouncyballs.com. Oh, excuse me, it's bouncyballs.org. I think I said .com a moment ago. No sign in for this one needed at all. You simply type in the web address, choose the theme that you want. What do you want to be uh, up on the board bouncing around? What total of your screen do you want to be filled? What's the sensitivity level? What sound do you want? And you are ready to go for your students to engage. And they can simply look up at the board occasionally to monitor their own noise level or listen for those prompting sounds like the beeping and the shh. All right, I mentioned at the very beginning that the other context to classroom management that we were going to talk about is just monitoring the level of engagement of your students. So um, three different applications that if you currently aren't using them with your students are a great way to uh, keep track of your classroom management in the digital world. So the first one is your Google Assignments. If you're using Google Assignments, this is going to most closely replicate the experience we had in Google Classroom, where you could be in the student's file in real time watching them work before they had even turned the assignment into you. So I use this in my own class all the time with my students. And while they are working on an assignment, I simply flip through their files that they're working in. And occasionally I will say things like, Tracy, I'm in your file. Where are you? 
because I can get an idea in real time whether they're, they've even opened the assignment. Are they on page one when everybody else in the class is now on page five? How much effort are they putting in? So um, a great way to see their progress, but you can also make comments on their file in real time. And that's another tool that I use all the time. I'll highlight a line of text and click on the comment box and say, hey, don't forget to tell me the name of this uh, you know, constellation that you're referring to here because you've described it, but you haven't named it. So I use the comments tool to help them um, do a better job in the assignment in real time while they're working on it. The next application that has some great classroom management features is Nearpod. One of my favorite ways to um, control student behaviors is turning on the setting that ensures students sign in. I know one of the frustrations with applications like Kahoot, uh, Blookit, even Nearpod and Lumio is that students can enter your um, assignment with a fake name. They get to put in a name of their choice when they start the activity, which means you get a bunch of crazy names that I have no idea who that is. And it's difficult for me to grade your assignment or give you feedback on it if I don't even know who you are. Nearpod allows you to turn on a setting that ensures that students sign in with their Google account so you know exactly who all of these crazy nicknames are. It also gives you reports for student engagement when they're engaged in like a live participation lesson. You can actually see which students have clicked into the activity, which students have gone through the matching, how many times did they have to attempt the matching before they got all of the matches correct. It gives you those reports so that you can see if your students are attempting the activity, did they get it immediately, did it take them six tries all those classroom management that tell you, are your students actually doing the activities that you're giving them? And then the final one, very similar to what you can do with Nearpod is your Lumio by Smart. This is that online version of Smart Notebook where the students can engage from their Chromebooks. Once again, you can force the students to sign in. If you disable what's called guest access, you know exactly who everybody in your Lumio lesson is because they're signed in with their Google accounts. This one allows you to do individual handouts, group workspace, and whole class whiteboard all in the same lesson. So slide number one can be you working independently. Slide number two can be where I put you into small groups and you can work only with the members of your group and see them in real time in that file engaging with you. Or we can do a whole class whiteboard where everybody's in the same workspace and we can all see each other's contributions. So it gives me an idea of who's doing what in the lesson in terms of what they're contributing and their level of engagement. Got some uh, handouts here that I will make available to you guys in the slideshow. Um, Nearpod, if you want to get a look at the reports that they have, it's formative assessment teaching link right there. Lumio, if you're new to that one, you have a link there in our slide deck for viewing student work in Lumio. And um, also we have self-paced courses on both uh, Lumio and Nearpod. If those are of interest to you and you wanna learn more about using either one of those applications. So I wanna thank you guys so much for uh, attending today's virtual session. If you have any questions, you can always contact your e-coach or me, your OIT teacher specialist. So thank you guys for everything today and I'll see you for the next virtual session.